For a few minutes, I want to talk from this thought, people, you got to love them. People, you got to love them. Father, in the awesome name of your son, Jesus, who is the Christ, we again approach your throne of grace. Prayers have already been lifted for this moment. In this service, outside of this service, persons have prayed to you for this very moment. So one more time, I come, I join the prayers that have been offered, asking you to fill me. And I ask that you would free me of any impediment that would interfere with the flow of your spirit, the flow of your message into our lives. Have your way in this moment so that you can have your way in the moments, hours, and weeks to come. We pray all of this in the strong name of your son who you sent for our sins, even Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. People. Wonderful. But at times, wearisome. People can be. We all enjoy the privilege of interfacing with, interacting with other people. And yet some of our greatest frustrations, and challenges, and trials also come from people. Lou Rawls sang a song many years ago that raised the question, what's the matter with the world? Has the world gone mad? And then he answers it by saying, there's nothing wrong with the world. It's just the people who are in it. And then he makes it clearer. He says, you and me, we're in it. And so People Make the World Go Round is another song of yesteryear. I want to encourage us today to remember that people are valuable to God. And therefore, whether they bring joy or whether they bring sorrow, you got to love them. People, you got to love them. That's what I believe is God's message for us today. We've got all kinds of turmoil going on in the world. We've experienced individually, collectively, racially, We've experienced all kinds of injustices at the hands of people. Many of us have suffered the loss of loved ones gunned down, loved ones who have been incarcerated, loved ones who have suffered violently at the hands of other people, and, and emotions rise up in us when we even remember and think about some of the atrocities that have taken place in our families' lives, in our friends' lives, in our own lives. And the Lord challenges us in the midst, in the wake of all of the madness in the world. And he wants to remind us that people, you got to love them. And so I want to say a little bit about that. I believe God wants to draw something out of these passages of Scripture to remind us of that because I suspect that there are some moments in everybody's life where you don't feel like loving people. But God reminds us that that is his expectation of us. So much so that uh, young Jonathan McReynolds, very popular uh, and gifted uh, Christian who writes beautiful music to honor the Lord. His most recently released song is entitled People. Allow me to read just a few of the words. Some of you may be well familiar with it, but 
Listen to some of the words of his song. They are the best and the worst you've created. Loving and hating and opinionated. Loners in basements and those congregated. Deliver me. Far from the peaceful shore I was sinking, deep in the ocean of thoughts they were thinking. Don't know what validation I was seeking. Deliver me from people. People. When you said you could heal me from anything, did you mean people? People? Deliver me, because I can't point, point them out. I won't say their names. I don't know the damage or which one to blame. It's just people. People deliver me. Then he offers this second stanza. She was the reason I smiled in the morning. He took the last bit of joy I was sh share storing. That's too much power for anything human. Deliver me from people. I know you can heal me from many things. What about people? I wonder if you've ever felt like that. If you've ever felt like, Lord, just deliver me from people. I'll, I'll work in isolation. I'll work at a desk. Just give me a job where I don't have to deal with people. Well, there's no question. People can get on your last nerve. The same people who bring you great joy and bring you great excitement and, and, and fill your life with all kind of good, there are those moments when those same people can cause you to be frustrated. So what is it that the Lord wants us to know today? He wants us to know that people come in all kinds of packaging. You know, they come in different colors, different pigmentations. People come with all kinds of peculiarities, proclivities. People come with all kinds of peculiarities and personalities. Oh, my goodness. People come rich, poor, black, white, lofty lowly. You find all kinds of people, full, empty. You find hearty and hungry people, all kinds of people. You find belligerent people. You find benevolent people. There are all kinds of people in the world, and we, our lives intersect with them over and over again. People. But God has us to interact with people on purpose. And so I want to ask today, what, what is it that God wants us to learn about loving people? And so there are three main thoughts to the message, and then I will be out of your way. Who are the people we love? Who are the people we're supposed to? To love, When he says that if God loved us in this way, we also must love one another. Who, who's the one? Who should we be loving? Well, I suspect that I will not cover every category today. But let me at least mention four. We ought to be loving family. We ought to love family. And yet, truth be told, there are many persons who find it hard to love family. In fact, they, they, they seem to have great joy as long as they're outside of the house. But they have some sibling rivalries. They have some issue with mom or dad. They have some kind of family stress. Something about family that can make, make it difficult. Even in the life of our Savior, family was tough. You know, Jesus was popular. He was sensational. People were tracking him and following him. And one day while he was out ministering to the masses, a message, a text message comes and, hey, your, your family wants to see you. They want to talk to you. The, the brothers and sisters are like, 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 so look, man, who do you think you are? Who, who are you supposed to be? They, they, they were trying to yank him down when God had raised him up. 
Many of us have experienced that kind of family. Not all families are dysfunctional like that, but many of us have, and, and, and too often, dysfunction is generational. And so the dysfunctionality of one family just continues down through the generations and nobody wants to talk about Uncle George. Nobody wants to talk about what happened to Aunt Sally. It's hushed, but, but it manifests itself in the family. But we're to call it with a love. Here's a fellow in the scripture named Joseph. Just a fine young man. The, the, the pride and joy of his daddy. He was the youngest of his brothers and yet the brothers despised him, the Bible said. So much so that they set him up to be sold, originally to be killed, but they backed off of that thanks to Reuben, and they sold him. They didn't know that he went into slavery. They didn't know they went in, he went into Potiphar's house and that God had favor on him and that he ended up being a, a leader in Potiphar's house. They didn't know he ended up in prison. They didn't know what happened to their brother until they needed food from Egypt. And when they went down to Egypt to get grain, to get food, they stood before a man asking that they might buy food, and the man took them on a trip. Took them on a road trip back home and back, and, and he was just trying to feel them out because they didn't know this is the same Joseph that you sold into slavery. But Joseph understood Family, you got to love them. And so he loved on his brothers anyhow, and he said to them, listen, don't you worry about what you did to me. What you meant for evil, God meant it for good so that he could preserve a whole generation. You got to love family. But not only is it family, but it's friends. We've got to love our friends. Jesus makes it clear to us that, that greater love has no man than this than he lay down his life for his friends. And that's a wonderful, memorable passage of scripture, but, but I find it striking who he's talking about when he uses the word friend. He's talking about a guy named Peter who was about to deny that he even knows him, but he calls him friend. He's including in that word a man named Judas who was about to sell him out to his enemies for, for a few coins and yet Judas is included in that number. My brothers and sisters, friends aren't just the ones who line up with you. But even those friends who use their close association with you like Brutus did with Caesar like Judas did with Jesus. They'll use their close, close association to take you out. Friends. Somebody said, with friends like that, who needs enemies? But friends, we've got to love them. I believe David spoke or wrote in one, one case about a, a friend. He said, I, I could have handled the offense. I could have handled what happened to me. The problem was that it was my friend who did it. Who else are we to love? We're to, we're to love foreigners. Love the foreigner. Jesus says, love your neighbor as yourself. And then when the question comes up, well, who is my neighbor? He gives an illustration of a man who was robbed on the Jericho Road. And the people who knew him, the people who were expected to, to support him and sustain him and help relieve him, they walked on by. But the foreigner bandaged him up. The foreigner took him to the hotel and the foreigner said, whatever his bill is, I'll pay it. The Lord is saying, love the foreigner. But we have foreigners in cages at the borders. We, we live with foreigners and we talk down about many of them, some of us. And we have to love the foreigner. We've we got to deal with the fact that, that they may not dress like we dress, eat like we eat. They may not speak the language we speak, but they are valuable to God, and we ought to love the foreigner. Don't you know that Jesus went out of his way to take a seat at Jacob's well? Why did he sit there? Because he knew a foreigner was coming. He knew that he had an opportunity to interface with a Samaritan woman and even from her own lips she said, hey, what are you asking me for water for? We, we don't talk like that. We don't get along like that, not Jews and Samaritans. So, so why are you coming at me like that? And Jesus just ignored what she said and said, look here, girl, if you just had a clue 
who you were talking to, you'd be asking me for water. Don't you know by the time that conversation ended, she was running into town telling other people, you got to come meet this man who told me everything about myself without condemning me. My brothers and sisters, we got to love the foreigner. And foreigners are all around us. We got to love them. And finally, we got to love foes. We got to love the folk who can't stand to see us can't stand to hear our name. We've got to love the folk who are just direct enemy. They can't sleep at night thinking about us. We've got to love our foes. David had a foe named Saul, but he showed love to him. He had opportunities to kill Saul, but he never would do it because he said, foes, you got to love them. The Bible says it this way. He, no, he, Jesus says, love your enemies. What, an, what, a, what a hard saying. He didn't just say put up with them. He didn't just say forgive them. He said love them. Who are we to love? Foes. He said, he said do good for those who don't mean good for you. It's like pouring hot coals on their heads. He said you got to love. Somebody, one of the pastors up in Baltimore used to say regularly, you've got to love the hell out of people. You got to love the unrighteousness out of people. You got to love the meanness out of people. Young lady who was with us last week when um, Daniel sang so beautifully for us, the young lady who helped him get around because of his, his blindness, had on the back of her phone, prove them wrong. And so all of the folk who want to talk about you, all of the folk who want to be enemies against you, just love them and prove them wrong. Well, we know why we uh, or who we ought to love. Let me say a few things about how we ought to love in the few minutes I have left. How should we love? Well, how did Jesus love? He's our model. How, how should we love? Let me give you a few ways to love. We should sh share connection with people. Get connected with people. We should share connection with them. That's how we love. Don't live at arm's length from people just because they're different just because they don't like you, just because you had an argument. No, get connected with people, share connection. That's what Jesus did. Jesus was very different from us, but in John chapter one it says that the, the word was made flesh and moved in the neighborhood. That's what the message translation says in verse 14. And, and, and dwelt among us. Jesus got connected with us because love of people mattered. That's what we have to show. Get connected with people. When the, when the, before the day is over, there may be a neighbor on either side of you. You've been living there for 10 years. Don't know their name because they're Asian. Don't know their name. They're African. Don't know their name. God says, get connected. Then he says, we show commitment to people. Not just connection with people, but commitment to people. Folk had been following Jesus for a few days. They were hungry. The disciples had no commitment to them. The disciples told Jesus, send them home. And Jesus said, no, y'all feed them. And they said, we, we don't have enough to feed them. Jesus said, let me show, what, show you what commitment looks like. Sit them down. Find out what you got out there. Seated them. They had two fish, five loaves of bread. Jesus prayed over what he had and sent them out with it. And after everybody had eaten to the full, they still had baskets full left over. Jesus said, now that's commitment. You do what it takes. Get connected with people. Be committed to people. Jesus rode through a storm to get to Legion. How many storms would we ride through to get to a, a demon-possessed person? Jesus went through a storm on the Sea of Galilee to help that man find deliverance. Third thing is that we show compassion for people. We get connected with them. We show commitment to them, but we also show compassion for them. The Bible says that Jesus saw a people and they, he, he was moved with compassion because they looked like sheep without a shepherd. They were wandering aimlessly. 
Jesus came all this way to show us what love looks like. It looks like compassion for people. He knew that this widow of name had not only lost her son, but she had already lost her husband. And so he stopped by the casket and just put his hand on the casket, told the boy to rise, and brought that son back to life. Jesus cares about us. You're laying in the bed with COVID. You've got family members you can't see because they're hospitalized, not even with COVID, but the way the hospitals operate, you can't see see them God says listen I, there are ways to show compassion even though you can't get there we show concern for people Mary and Martha were, were in distress Jesus left where he was came and said well, show me where you laid Lazarus I've got concern about you called out Lazarus name and he came back Show concern. He says that, that, that I came for the lost sheep of Israel. I've got concern about them. He said other sheep I have who are not of this fold, them too I must bring. I've got concern for people. What about us? Jesus said the thief comes but for to steal, kill, and destroy. But I've come that you might have life. And have it more abundantly. God is saying this is what love looks like. It looks like helping people who are being robbed every day by the thieves of this world. Political thieves. Business thieves. Racial thieves. People who are robbing from men and women, boys and girls on a daily basis. Somebody show concern enough to stand up and speak up for them. And then we have one other thing. We share Christ with people. It's great to be connected, it's great to be concerned, it's great to be committed, it's great to show compassion, but don't even call them a friend if you're not going to share Christ with them. What kind of friend of you? You found Christ, you know Christ, you're going to heaven, and you don't mind your friend going to hell. What kind of family member are you? You're going to heaven, but you don't care whether your auntie goes to hell. You don't care whether your brother hears the gospel. What kind of family member is that? And even our foes, many times we hear the phrase, I wouldn't even want that for my worst enemy. Well, how many of us want hell for our worst enemies? No, share Christ with them. Mary Magdalene shared Christ. Even though people looked down on her, she shared Christ. The woman at the well, they talked about her, they scandalized her. But when she found Christ, who did she go to? She ran to the same people who scandalized her name, who gossiped about her on a daily basis. She ran to those same people and said, come meet a man who told me all about myself. And when that whole chapter is over, those people are saying, look girl, we're not believing him because of you anymore. We're believing him because of what we've experienced ourselves. Share Christ with people and let me close by telling us why we love we know who to love we know how to love why do we love let me just offer these three thoughts and I'm out of your way the text tells us that we ought to love because we are born of his love how, how do we get born again because of the love of God that's what the text says the scriptural text says us that we're born of God, and this, the Bible also, the text also says God is love. So we've been born of the love of God. John 3, 16 says God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Why should we go to the lost? Why should we go to the least? Why should we go to the racist, to the rapist? Why should we go to the arsonist? Why should we go to the wicked? Because we are products of God's love. The Bible says he gave his son for our sins. That means that we were wretched. We didn't deserve him, but we're born of God's love. That's why we go. Second reason that we go is that we love because we are beneficiaries of his love. New birth is not the only benefit that we get from God's love. Thank God that I get the benefit of a new life of new birth, of redemption, of having my sins covered by the precious blood of Jesus because of his love. Thank God for that benefit, but I wake up every day to a new benefit. I 
get his love. Every step I take, every meal I eat, every friend I have, every relationship that is cherished, those things come from the love of God. He looks beyond my fault. He covers the sins that I commit on a daily basis. I don't know about you, but I'm a beneficiary of the love of God, so I ought to show the love of God. Last thing that I want us to know today, or I believe God wants us to know today about people, you got to love them in spite of them. You got to love them because you're born of love. We got to love them because we're beneficiaries of God's love. And finally, we got to love them because we're brokers of God's love. We're love brokers. We're walking billboards. We're walking advertisement. We, we are are put on fire so that we can go to people whose lives are cold, whose lives are empty, and burn, let the Holy Ghost live and burn through us. The Bible says here that, that he saved us so he could live through us. That means that, that, that we broker relationships. He uses us to get a message to people and then uses the Holy Spirit to use that message to convict them. But without a broker, without a representative, without an agent out there, they won't hear the gospel. So no, it's not our job to save anybody, but it's our job to broker it. The church is a brokerage. We're all representatives. We're all agents. The problem is too many of us are secret agents. We've got to go public as agents for the Lord Jesus Christ. Got to go public as ambassadors of love. We got to let people know that we love them. And listen, love isn't as noticeable in the, in the sunlight. It's not as noticeable when everything's going right. But you let somebody curse you. That's when you show love. Let somebody cut you that's when sh love shines its best let somebody betray you that's the way love shows its best face Jesus did that they cut him they whipped him they scorned him they nailed him to a tree they mocked him but all along the way he kept showing the love of God he forgave those who were at his feet he took care of his mother and his disciple he forgave the disciple off to his right he was showing the love of God and he loved us so much that he would not come down from the cross. Love kept him up there. He loved you too much, loved me too much to come down. He loved us so much that he invited death to come get him because he knew that the wages of sin was not suffering, but the wages of sin is death. So he had to die on Friday. But he loved us so much that he got up on Sunday, not with some power, but with all power. Anybody glad that he loves us? And because he loves us, he walks with us. He talks with us. He tells us that we are his own. And don't you know that because he loves us, he's preparing a place for us so that when this life is over, we'll gather with him up in the yonder in the eternity and every day will be a day of celebration every day will be a day of coronation every day will be a day of jubilation so why wait till you get there go ahead and express your jubilation now go ahead and get your praise in now go ahead and get your dance in now and no matter what people do to you remember you gotta love them this text says we must love them because he loved us. And won't it be wonderful that one of those days when we see Christ face to face, there'll be some people up there who hated us down here. But the more they, they flung at us, the more love they saw in us. And one day, we may have never known about it, but one day they decided, she's for real. He's for real, and I want something real. And they would have given their life to Christ, and you won't even know it until eternity. And you'll be saying, what are they doing here? And they'll say, I understand why you asked the question, but I watched you. I watched you when you were going through. I watched you 
when I despised you, when I tried my best to hurt you, I watched you keep loving me. So much so that I got convicted. So thank you for loving me. That's what we ought to hear. And so just get it in your spirit. Say it one time, wherever you are, whether you got anybody around you or not, just say, people, you got to love them. You got to love them. Father, in the name of your son, we thank you for love. No natural love. We don't have it naturally. We thank you that it's supernatural. But that you pour it out in the hearts of your people so that we can broker it. We can display it and we can offer it to other people. We love you. I pray that you would move on the hearts of people who may have never said yes to Jesus. That they will accept his love today. Accept his life today. Be glorified through some decision that's made. And then Lord, if somebody needs to become a part of this church family, they're wandering, they're saved, but they're wandering. They don't really have a shepherd in their life. They don't have brothers and sisters who care about them in the faith. Move on their hearts that they will take action and join with this family today. I pray this in the strong name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the church says, amen. Amen. Well, I pray that you've been blessed by the music, blessed by the other ministries, and blessed by the message. Now let's put the message into action. There are some people who are hard to love, but you got to love them. Remember that. Share that good news with other people. God makes it possible.